All right, we're in Romans chapter 9. If we're going to look at verse 14 to 24, a message entitled, Is God uh, Unrighteous? And we've been learning about principles of righteousness uh, since back in, uh, in chapter 1. The first one was that, uh, the principle of condemnation. That was a real thrill for, for many weeks <laughs> to come to the summary statement of Paul in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's important to remember that, and we're going to make reference to it. It helps us make sense of what we're going to be studying in this portion of Romans chapter 9 of uh, this morning, that, uh, that everybody uh, is, uh, is deserving of condemnation from God. Jesus said, I have not come into the world to, to condemn the world, but to save the world from its sins. He didn't come to condemn it because everybody stands condemned already because uh, of our own sin. We need to be saved from it. So, again, that was his first point. His second point was the point of justification. When we come to Jesus Christ and we come to God and we confess our sins and ask him to forgive us based on his death and his resurrection on our behalf, then he declares us, uh, as a judge would declare uh, somebody to be pardoned, uh, to be innocent. So justification is we're declared to be righteous. No, we're not righteous, we're not perfect, and we still uh, have issues and problems and things that are going on in our lives that are, that are not, not pleasing to God and so forth. But as far as our standing before God, He declares us to be righteous. The third principle then was the doctrine of sanctification. That when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit. God's presence begins to live, to dwell uh, within us. And uh, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to conform us to the image of, uh, of Jesus Christ. He's working in us, and uh, we even uh, went to 2 Corinthians 3.18, did a little message there to help us understand that process. And why sometimes it seems like it's going a lot faster and a lot better than, uh, than at other times, uh, sanctification. Then we got to chapter 8, and we looked at the principle of the security of the believer. Chapter begins... Therefore, there is now no condemnation, and it ends, there is no separation. And we went through what we call Romans 8, what's been called by Christians for many years, the glory road. All the wonderful promises that are in Romans 8 in regards to God working in our lives, uh, the security that we have in the relationship that we have with Him, and nothing can change it, nothing can separate us from it. And uh, it's one of the reasons we spent uh, about three, three studies just on on that chapter. It's uh, just so wonderful and uh, probably the favorite chapter of many Christians down through the centuries. That takes us to chapter 9. Chapter 9 then gets into the section of 9, 10, and 11, which some writers in the past, some teachers today, would say is kind of a parenthesis, kind of an insert uh, into what Paul's been teaching about. And in fact, <clears throat> many through the centuries haven't taught it. They jump right to 12 and begin to take the, to teach the practical application of what it is now to live uh, the Christian life. They do that because it's very Jewish by the time you get there. Uh, this chapter, all of his illustrations are about the past in, uh, in Israel's history. Last week, we looked at Isaac and Ishmael as examples. We looked at Jacob and Esau as examples. This week, it's, it's going to be Moses and Pharaoh are going to be a couple of our examples. Examples from the past history of, uh, of Israel. Uh, next week, he'll, Paul will focus in on Judaism and where it was in the first century, and then chapter 11, it's glorious restoration uh, in future. But it's not an insert, because if you've been with us, you've noted, I've tried to make mention many times that Romans is uh, primarily written to a Jewish audience. The church in Rome uh, evidently was very Jewish, had some Gentiles, and in chapter 11, he turns a coin, corner and says, and you Gentiles also. But uh, up until now, teaching is very rabbinical in style. Paul asks a question and answers it with a question. Maybe follows up with a question and answers that with a question. Uh, his, act, uh, his examples, his illustration, his teaching style. Therefore, this is not a parenthesis. It's to help us understand chapter 8. Wonderful promises. Can we rely on them? Is it really true? All those wonderful things that are there. Because some would say, we saw last week in the title of the message, but hasn't God's uh, plan failed? After all, he raised up Abraham. He brought uh, 12 sons uh, eventually through Jacob, built them into a nation, all to bring the Messiah. The Messiah comes, and the nation rejected him. Hasn't the plan failed? We said last week, no, his plan hasn't failed. 
because we misunderstood the plan. People don't get saved by physical being a physical descendant. We say God doesn't have grandchildren, only children. Everybody has to come uh, on their own. And he doesn't save everybody. Everybody doesn't get saved. That's kind of part of this point here. People get saved because God shows mercy uh, to them. Uh, and if it's all God's work, all what God is doing, his point is the, the plan hasn't failed. We misunderstood the plan, and we can believe and we can trust the promises of God. We've also mentioned that, oh, by the way, this is a really difficult passage of Scripture and uh, to go through. Uh, and it's one that we often don't want to focus on or hear sometimes because in the debate of our own salvation, I think we like the scriptures of free will choice that I chose, which we do. And there are those passages. There's even the passages that talk about free will choice and God's sovereignty right in the same context of the same passage. But this is one of those passages. Last week, this week, <laughs> it doesn't mention anything about free will choice. It's all God. <laughs> it's all God and all God's mercy that he is has shown uh, upon us. Uh, so let's take a look at verse 14. Uh, we concluded last week by saying the disobedience of the nation of Israel cannot nullify the purposes of God. In other words, God's faithful even when the people are unfaithful. Beginning with the question, of course, verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? And he says, certainly not. In uh, some translations, the old King James would say, God forbid uh, Paul's answer seems uh, insufficient, but that's his answer. Uh, is, God, is there any unrighteousness in, in God? No. <laughs> that, that's it. Uh, because if God's God, then there's not. If we understand who he is and his character, there's not. Paul, in a sense, is like saying, and that ought to pretty much end the argument. Because uh, uh, we can't say that, that about anybody else, but certainly we can say that about God. Uh, we sang a song uh, earlier. Uh, with, uh, with Mark leading us is that uh, uh, you've become too small in our eyes. Forgive me. That's part of the problem that we have today in our own thinking about God working in our life and God's sovereignty and so forth and dealing with issues of his sovereignty in regards to salvation, his election, his calling, these words that, uh, that we use. Because sometimes we, we, just, we forget how big God is and who God is and how powerful God is. A.W. Tozier writing a generation ago, and uh, all of his books are wonderful, and, and in them, uh, many of them published in the late 50s, were, were saying, here's the problem I foresee in the future because of the direction the church in the United States and America is going. A lot of the things he pointed out have, have come to pass, unfortunately. But this one, uh, quote, is about the misconception we can have about God. Tozer says, the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted it for one so low, so ignoble, as to utterly uh, unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. This she has done not deliberately, but little by little, without her knowledge, and her very unawareness only makes her situation all the more tragic. And certainly we've, we've arrived at that point today. I'll point out a couple of illustrations as we uh, uh, get into the text a little more. So God's choosing, we'd say, is always a matter of grace. If God only acted on the basis of righteousness, nobody would be saved. If God did the right thing, acted the fair way, nobody gets saved. So we're, we're kind of glad that we'd say point one, God's sovereign choice is based on mercy. And that's in verses 15 to 18. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion so that it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom he wills, he hardens. Subject, again, God's uh, mercy. We never want to ask for, uh, for God's uh, justice because justice gets us all to hell. I remember uh, being a very young Christian uh, and Danny Lehman explaining to me that, uh, uh, that uh, anything we have this side of hell is all by the grace of God. God gives us what we deserve. That's what we get. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us his mercy. And Jesus tells a parable to help us understand this in, uh, in Luke's gospel. 
I'll read it to you in a moment, but again, it's a, a story. Jesus is trying to illustrate this idea of how important it is that we ask for mercy. And mercy is what gets us our salvation and our relationship with God. In the parable, it says in verse 9 of chapter 18, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves and that they were righteous. That was the problem, Pharisees of his day. And what else? They despised others. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The Pharisee was not a recipient of God's mercy, didn't even think that he needed it. But the tax collector knew better. He knew that the only way he would ever be forgiven, the only way he'd ever God would ever hear a prayer or a word he said was if he showed mercy to him. That's the focus here. The first example or issue of choice based on mercy is seen in the life of Moses. And here, and here uh, he quotes uh, this story of Moses in these words found in Exodus 33:19. Now, the, the scene uh, that they come from, we talked about last week. Children of Israel come out of Egypt. The Lord uh, delivered them out of the bondage of slavery. They're with Pharaoh and so forth through all the miracles, passing through the Red Sea. Uh, they end up there in uh, uh, the Sinai Desert. Uh, Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the law of God, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. He's up there. While he's up there, God says to him, remember, oh, by the way, I think you better go back down uh, and see what's going on. Because uh, in this 40 days that he was up there, people have decided maybe that Moses guy is not coming back. If we want to really worship God, we need an image of him. And so they all throw in their, their gold. Where did they get that gold, by the way? Oh, that was given to them by the Egyptians because God put it in the hearts for them to do that. They take that gold that they did not earn, that was given to them. They throw it into uh, basically uh, uh, the fire and melt it, and they cast an image of, uh, of a calf god, which was uh, uh, very popular in Egypt. They were familiar with it, and they began to <coughs> worship. Part of the worship was very sensual. It was very sexual. And this whole thing breaks out uh, in all the camp. Uh, God says, I think you better go back down. Remember, Moses goes down. He's just a little bit ticked when he gets down. Throws the Ten Commandments written on stone. They shatter in pieces. And basically, he goes and kind of has it out with Aaron. Uh, and God's judgment begins to fall on the people. And thousands of them die. <coughs> but not all of them, because there are a million plus. So there's like a million people plus that are spared God's judgment. That they all deserve to die at that point. They were all slaves. They were all delivered. They all saw the miracles. They all passed through the Red Sea. They were all being guided by God's physical presence, the fire at night, and the Shekinah glory at that day. And they, they rebelled radically against them pretty quickly. They all deserved God's judgment. This is his point. Yes, they all did. But he didn't show it all of them. Because as Moses goes back up to spend time with God after that, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and, and, uh, and basically I'll, I'll deal with the, everybody else. The reason that God didn't destroy them all was because it was mercy. That's his first uh, illustration. Uh, Romans 3.10, he's already kind of laid this out for us, and this idea that all are condemned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So when we are justified, when we're declared to be righteous, it's because of of God's mercy. When he begins to work in our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit, his work in our lives, it's because of his mercy. When he teaches us about the security of our own faith and we can trust and believe his promises, uh, it's because of his mercy. Now notice he again reiterates this thing, it's not by human effort, verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. One writer said, Willing and running may indicate the possession of grace, but they are not the originating cause. And after we're saved, we might have a, a will to please God, a desire to walk with Him. We might be running, 
the race with the Lord and doing things for the Lord because of what he's done for us and our love for him. But it was never the originating cause. That's, that's the idea. No, uh, no willing and no running. And, uh, and all of this then means that, uh, that uh, God has been merciful to us because we've come to faith in him. Therefore, God is not merciful to everyone. Therefore, not everyone is going to be saved. Now, I know we don't, we don't like stating it that way because we like the, the free will choice. And there is the whosoever will come, I will in no way cast them out. You know, anyone that would believe John 3.16 has eternal life. Uh, you know, he who has the Son has life. We, we understand all of that. That's not part of the discussion so that we can understand what Paul is saying here. Why we can trust and believe the promises of God because they're not based on what we do. <coughs> just based on God and based on his character and the fact that we can trust him. Therefore, God is not merciful to all. Jesus says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. <clears throat> but this is not a popular idea. And this is an idea that in some ways is slipping within Christianity in the church today, at least in the United States. It's called universalism. It's always, it's always been around, this idea that, <clears throat> well, I understand all of that, but also, God is loving, and he is so loving, and he is so kind, and he is so gracious, and see who is good, he is so good. You're not telling me that people are actually going to be judged, because I don't think they will. I think in the end, as one popular book of two years ago says, love wins. In the end, love wins. That means somehow, some way, at some point, everybody gets saved. And nobody is ever judged. That book was very popular, written by a pastor, Rob Bell of a church of 10,000 people. And, uh, and uh, of course, there was a firestorm of criti critics that came out against it. Praise God. Somebody holding to the inspiration of the, of the word of God and so forth. Uh, but, uh, hey, popular with a lot. A lot of people. Uh, there was a book uh, shortly before that uh, about this same concept written in a novel form. It spent 50 weeks as the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list. It sold 15 million copies. It was called The Shack. The Shack was a story about a, a guy named uh, Mac whose uh, daughter is murdered. Uh, he's grieving over that, the remorse over that. He can never get over this violent act committed against his daughter that he loved. He stumbles through the woods one day, comes to a shack and enters, and then God is personified as different people in this cabin that have this conversation with them. And it's a feel-good story about the fact that he's able to reconcile all of this in his heart and mind. By the time he leaves the shack and goes out into the world, he feels good about it and he's able to deal with it and cope with life. The problem with the book, and there are many doctrinal problems, the way it represents God and who he is and so forth is atrocious to say the, the least. Uh, but the author that wrote it, uh, William Paul Young, is a universalist. Everybody wins. Everybody gets saved in the end. God does not condemn anyone. Anyway, so these issues that Paul are bringing up here are ones that we need to think about and think through uh, because the opposite that departs from biblical Christianity <coughs> is a concept that feels good, sounds good, and actually gets traction out there, not with just a few people, but with 15, people, 15 million that read uh, that one book. Then even in reading it, here's what, even in reading it, it sounded good, it felt good, and nobody even thought about the theolo theological implications of it. It just didn't register. Part of it is because, well, we don't want to talk about that, do we? We like the idea. We would like the idea that everybody gets saved. That certainly would relieve my conscience in terms of trying to get the gospel out to everybody. <clears throat> we certainly wouldn't have the heart that Paul has as he opens up the chapter saying, if I could. I would trade my own salvation if the Jewish people could get saved. And you have a sense that he would do it in a heartbeat because he cared so much about people and the lost. Why? Because they are really lost unless the mercy of God comes to them. Secondly, we'd say the choice of mercy is contrasted now in the life of Moses and Pharaoh. The second example, one is Moses himself in a quote. Uh, this one is a quote from Exodus 9.16. Pharaoh becomes the illustration. Again, you have Moses, who's Jewish. You got Pharaoh, the Gentile. Both were sinners. Both were murderers, by the way. But, uh, but God 
uh, uh, both saw all of the miracles. God saw, uh, they both saw everything that, that God did there in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, and yet Moses is saved because God showed him mercy and Pharaoh is not saved. Look at verse 17 again. For this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So God raises up Pharaoh to reveal his power uh, and his glory in it. And he was. Pharaoh was a famous guy. I mean, when this is going on, he's on like CNN every night. Uh, because, you know, they worship the Nile. God turns the Nile into blood. Wow, that's not good. Not looking good. One for Jehovah, zero for the gods of Egypt so far. You know, then they worship the frogs. And we got that. We got the lice. We got the everything that they worship. Everything that they esteem. Uh, by the time they're over, it's like it's a shutout. You know, uh, Pharaoh hasn't gotten anything. And he's now an international figure. Everybody knows about it. It's on all the networks. You say, are you sure? Yeah, because by the time Joshua comes into the land and he sends two spies into the city of Jericho, what do they hear from Rahab? Hey, you guys are famous because of what your God did to that guy Pharaoh down in Egypt. They all know. No TV, of course. Uh, no uh, instant media, but they all knew about it. He becomes an international star. God's glory is seen in him because of God's triumph over him. He's, he's the next illustration. Certainly we would say that Pharaoh was the ruler and Moses was the slave. And yet Moses experienced God's mercy and Pharaoh doesn't. Pharaoh deserved death. God didn't strike him down. Could have struck him down uh, uh, initially. But he prolongs his life in a sense in his sovereignty so he could work and he can act God could according to his own will and his own purposes. It's not a matter of righteousness. It's a matter of God's sovereign will. And it's like, is that fair? And Paul says, yes, it is. Because God is God. And he can show mercy on who he shows mercy. And uh, who he turns not to, he doesn't. It's kind of a scary thought. Uh, but let's stay with it. But this helps me. Warren Wiersbe says this. To help us understand because there's the balance that God is holy and just and righteous. He's also loving. Generous, kind, gracious, and merciful. And he is both. Uh, Warren Wiersbe says God is holy and must punish sin. We would all agree with that. I mean, you, you, we, it bothers us when somebody commits a horrible crime and then they go before the courts and they're off in a technicality. That just kind of ticks us off because God built in all of us a sense of justice. And it bothers us. We'd say, that's not a good judge. That judge arbitrarily says, well, I've decided today not to punish you. How about the, uh, the guy that did the marathon bombing there in Boston? Comes before a federal judge and there's all the evidence together. He goes, yeah, but today I'm going to let you off. There, there'd be a, a few riots in the street. We'd say, that is not a good judge. And, and God is a good judge. God is holy and must punish sin. But God is loving and desires to save sinners. If everybody is saved, it would deny his holiness. But if everybody is lost, it would deny his love. The solution to the problem is God's sovereign election. And then he goes on saying a seminary professor once said to him, try to explain election and you may lose your mind. Explain it away and you may lose your soul. Both things are true. And again, the focus is not in this passage on man's free will choice. There's passages where both exist as a parallel together. Here the focus, and we'll try to stay on it, although i got to keep mentioning the free will just so nobody gets up and walks out. But I've got to keep mentioning we want to kind of hammer the point home that Paul's trying to help us understand. Why can we believe God's promises? Why, should, why do we know that one day we'll be with God forever in heaven? Because he showed mercy to us. Was it based on anything we did? No, it wasn't. That, that's his point. That, therefore, we can believe the promises of Romans 8. The, the third choice uh, based on mercy is seen in Pharaoh, the hardening of his heart. I don't know if you uh, saw that in the text. God actually hardens his heart. If you go back and read Exodus 7 to 14, it's mentioned 15 times. In some texts, we're told, chapter 8, verse 15, 19, and 32, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But also, we find out in chapter 9, verse 12, chapter 10, verse 1, 20 and 27, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So which is it? Well, it's, it's really both. But the fault lay not in God, but in Pharaoh. Pharaoh was never forced to do anything. God hardened his heart in the end 
So he would do what he intended to do all along, which was to never let them go and never give up, no matter what, uh, what happened. We say that, uh, as many writers say, as the sunlight melts the ice, it also hardens the clay. Uh, and that's what we have here. Pharaoh's heart, I mean, he saw the miracles. He saw what God did. Every God that he had, that he held in high esteem, God basically showed him up, showed him down, and showed him who he was, his power, and so forth. Uh, and Moses pleading with him to just simply let them go. Pharaoh refuses and refuses and refuses. Uh, and therefore, we would say that God is not unrighteous in his dealing with Pharaoh because he gave him so many opportunities to repent and believe, and he decided not to. So he's not saved. And, uh, and that's the point here. Uh, is God's plan in effect? Yes. Everybody that places their faith in him is saved. It's not by physical descendancy. It's not by showing up at a church service or any of those things. I love the, uh, the uh, old Martin Luther line uh, that, uh, that he said that uh, uh, if people could get to heaven by simply going to church, there'll be many dogs in heaven because they sleep on the front steps of the, of the of church almost 24-7. So if going to church uh, will get you to heaven, then there'll be a lot of dogs. He says if working can get you to church, then there'll be a lot of mules in heaven because in his day, of course, a lot of mules pulled the plow. They worked harder than anybody else. So if going to church and working hard gets you, there'll be a lot of dogs and a lot of mules in heaven. And the uh, vernacular of today, Keith Green came along later and said that if uh, going to church makes you a Christian, then going to McDonald's will make you a hamburger. But we would say none of those things are true. It's because God shows his mercy uh, upon us. Paul's second question concerning the righteousness of God is in verse 19. You will say to me, then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? And the reason he goes like this all you see, Pharaoh was manipulated by God to work out his plan. That Pharaoh's evil actually brought glory to God. So how can Pharaoh be held accountable since his actions were used by God? Therefore, God is unfair or unjust. And, uh, and certainly, it's an age-old question, the justice of God working out in human history. And uh, in Genesis 18, 25, uh, there, the writer says, Moses says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And that's his whole point again. Is God unrighteous? Absolutely not. Why? Because he's God. Is God ever unfair with anyone? Absolutely not. Why? Because he's God. As we look at his character and who he is, uh, it, it's an impossibility. Again, the words God forbid. He had mercy on Moses, but he condemned Pharaoh. Is that unjust? He liked that Israel, rejected other nations. Is that unjust? No, his choice is based on mercy. Our problem, verse 20 to 24, we don't always comprehend the wisdom of God. Let's just say most of the time we don't comprehend the, the wisdom of God. Verse 20, and that's our problem. He says, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God wanted to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even <coughs> us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So Paul, of course, uh, answers that, the question, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? And the term uh, reply there, or against, excuse me, the term against means in rebellion. Who are you to speak this rebellious concept directly back to God, is, is the idea. Uh, and I like what one writer uh, said about this. He says, uh, this puny man, stands before, I don't know why I just like the phrase, this puny man stands before uh, the God who knows the end from the beginning, who has never learned anything because he knows everything, who is the perfection of wisdom and love, and talks back to him. Paul said, <coughs> along with this writer, that's very absurd. Found this other little uh, poem I thought was, uh, was good. It says, you cannot, put a, uh, you cannot put a little star in motion. You cannot shape one single forest leaf. 
nor fling a mountain up, nor sink an ocean deep. You are a presumptuous pygmy, large with unbelief. You cannot bring one down of regal splendor, nor bid the day to shadowy twilight fall, nor send the pale moon forth with radiance tender, and you dare to doubt the one who's done it all. Again, the God that we worship, that we serve, that shows us mercy is the God who spoke creation into existence. So it would kind of make sense that there are sometimes we do not understand his wisdom. Sometimes we don't understand exactly why he does what he does. He says first, our lack of comprehension is seen in the illustration of the master potter in the clay. And again, there's a quote from Genesis, uh, and there's a reference to, uh, to Jeremiah. We'll look at both of them. Uh, we first, say, or excuse me, Isaiah is the, uh, the other reference. But we say first that Abraham got it right in the humility of his life. In uh, Genesis 18, 27, where it says, Indeed, now I am but dust and ashes, and have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. This is when he's having the conversation with God before he's going to go down and, and wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. May I speak to you? I'm just but dust and ashes, <laughs> but can I speak to you? That's what we call the fear of God. Which, by the way, is the beginning, not just of wisdom, the, the implication is the beginning of logical thinking for, for everything. To have that, uh, that concept of God. Now, again, uh, God being wiser than us, our foolish questions to him, uh, is, a, is a reference to Isaiah 45, 9. The whole verse says, Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd, as a pottery, strive with the potsherds of the earth. Let the clay strive with the clay. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Is our reference. Or shall your handiwork say he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord. The Holy One of Israel and his maker, ask, of, ask me of things to come concerning my sons. And concerning the work of my hands, you command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens. And all the host, the starry host, I have commanded. So God is saying, God is saying, he's talking to me. <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying here. You realize who, who, who you're, you're talk, talking to. Uh, the clay, by the way, the clay is us. <laughs> the potter, the master potter is, is God. The clay is in its fallen state, of course. When we were created, we were created like everything, and it was good. But after the fall of Adam and Eve, sin entering the world, and entering mankind, we become uh, the clay in a fallen state at this point. Paul then asked the question, does clay ever talk back to the potter? Now, if you're a potter and work with uh, ceramics, and if your clay is talking back to you, I would suggest you bend your kilns a little better. Because there's <laughs> some fumes you're probably getting there that uh, maybe are creating uh, creating some problems. I've got kilns for my glass. I always try to make sure uh, they're vented well. But moreover, the clay of mankind is sinfully through and through. It's not, we're not neutral somehow. And to be sure, the clay has no life. It's passive. It's in the potter's sand. Unlike us, in terms of the illustration, we have feelings. We have an intellect. We have willpower. We can resist him if, if we choose. The point is it would be foolish to do that and to question him. Now, the other reference, as I said, is Jeremiah, it's Jeremiah 18. <coughs> And kind of a classic passage in, in Jeremiah, uh, where it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel that seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So again, if you if you watch guys uh, throw pots, and it's uh, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. You know, we used to do um, Kathy and I some pretty big uh, big crafts fairs, and uh, and attended some uh, some pretty big uh, big ones on the mainland. And uh, the two things in terms of uh, a lot of these big fairs, there has to be demonstrations going on, and. Um, uh, nobody wants to watch me cut pieces of glass uh, after about 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, he's doing that again. But uh, people are very fascinated at two things. Uh, 
A guy blowing glass because of the motion of the liquidity of the glass and the shaping of it and also the potter. To watch a guy center that clay and then kind of bring it up and it's just, it's just amazing to watch it be formed uh, in his hand. And you don't know what the vessel is going to be. Uh, only, only the potter does as he, he forms it. And it's, it's uh, very fascinating to watch. And if you've watched, you've noticed there's times when he's bringing the pot up and he doesn't like how it's coming out. Or he feels a little impurity or something in a fingertip and there's something he needs to remove. And he's, you think, that looked pretty good to me. You know, and then he just smashes the thing, right? And then he throws it down, he recenters, and he goes again. That's what Jeremiah watched. And God says, that's the illustration. Does that potter have the right to do that with his clay? Yeah, he, he actually does. And he says, well, O house of Israel, do I have the right to do that with you? That's the reference here over in our, in our New Testament passage in Romans 9. I'll have mercy on them. I have mercy. Uh, there's an illustration of, of uh, Moses and Pharaoh. But there's the illustration now of a, a potter shaping, uh, shaping a pot with the clay. Does the, does the master potter have the right to do that? And we would say, yeah. We don't understand what he's making, but obviously he knows what he's doing. And there's not much the clay can do about it anyway. I don't know if you noticed that. But, but again, there's where the illustration breaks down. Because we can resist his will and so forth. We have, do have an intellect, and, uh, and the clay doesn't. The Pharaoh, we'd say, had great opportunities. He learned about the true God. He learned what it was to trust him, but he chose to rebel. Paul, again, doesn't develop any truth about free will choice because it's all about the sovereignty of God here. So we'd say, again, our lack of comprehension is seen in the illustration of the master potter and the clay. Uh, and then the comparison between two types of clay vessels. I don't know if you saw that. There are the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And, uh, and a fair question might be, well, I get that because all, all are deserving that. We already established that. Uh, why are some selected for, uh, for honor? Well, what we know is that God can be relied on to act consistently because of his uh, character. And guess what? He doesn't always tell us all the events or what's going on. God doesn't always explain to us why he's doing what he's doing. But what we do know about his character from his dealing with his people that he loves in the Old Testament and then especially in terms of the person of Christ. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He acts exactly the way the Father would act. And you watch Jesus, he is pretty, he's pretty sharp with religious bigotry and self-righteous people. And he says things to him like, you're a white sepulcher. You look good on the outside, but you stink and rot on the inside. Sweet Jesus, meek and mild said that. Uh, but yet to the person that has leprosy, he'll reach out and touch them and heal them. He'll go to the person in need. When he walks into the Capernaum synagogue there off the Sea of Galilee, even his critics know he's going to go to that guy, that guy with the withered hand, the guy that's hurting the most. Let's watch because that's where Jesus would go. Even his critics knew that. He goes to the dis disfranchised, the tax collector, the prostitute, the people that nobody else would touch or go to, Jesus goes to. That's God. So when we wonder, where's the wisdom in God in that? Is this fair that God is really doing this way? Paul's saying it's a little bit of an absurd argument when we consider the wisdom of God. There's the illustration. After all, he's the master potter, and we're simply the clay. And there are two types of clay. Some are vessels uh, of wrath, uh, and some, uh, some are vessels of mercy. We could get a verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath to make his power known, Endured with much long suffering. That's patience with people, long suffering. The vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Who's the vessels of wrath? Well, that's pretty much everybody, but some of us have come to know his mercy. But he endured with long suffering. Uh, do you think his view of Pharaoh was so different than ours? If you were, if if we're part of the children of Israel living in Egypt, we're probably not saying wonderful things about Pharaoh. You know, we're not. Uh, we're not praying for him to get saved. We just want to go, you know. But uh, that's not God's perspective. God is looking with him and enduring with much long suffering. We see that with Jesus on the cross. The people that are crucifying, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's, that's the heart of God. God says to Moses, in terms of watching all of this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. And I've heard their cry, for I know their sorrows. And yet God looks with Pharaoh with long suffering, which indicates that he gave a lot of opportunities. 
I mean, he knew where Pharaoh was going with all this. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he'd done in the past. And yet he looks on him with long suffering. Now, again, the word which says that, that, that he was prepared, Old King James says, that fitted uh, in verse 22, uh, is in a middle voice. And that's important because it means it was not something done to him. It was something he did himself. Was he a vessel fitted for wrath? Yes, he was. He did that to himself. That, that's, that's the idea. And very important to note. But then there's also the vessels of mercies that he po points out. The ones that experienced the riches of his glory. In Moses and Israel, God revealed his riches of mercy. Pharaoh in Egypt, he revealed his power uh, in his wrath. And again, we saw earlier in the chapter the contrast with Jacob with Esau. Again, we talked about Esau. We call him, call him Big Red, the living beer commercial. Uh, and Jacob, <laughs> Jacob kind of uh, stumbled through life. It took him a long time. It was toward the end of his life before he really, really surrendered uh, to the Lord and to, and to trust God. And the point is, neither one of these guys deserved God's mercy, as we saw last week, but one of them got it. Dr. Barnhouse, great preacher of a generation ago, said, both of these brothers were born in sin. They both had the nature of Adam. They both grew up in sin. They both were children of wrath, disobedient by nature. If there had been any merit in these two sons, God would have been unjust in not rewarding that merit. If one of them deserved it, or they both, he would have been unjust in not rewarding it. The choice of one deserving man over another deserving man would have been favoritism. If they were both equal in terms of that deserving, and he picks one and not the other, that would have been favoritism. When we see that the two were equally undeserving, the whole picture becomes different. Everything that is said in the entire Bible about the nature of fallen man may be said, must be said about both Jacob and Esau. God determined for causes that are to be found in himself and has not been revealed to us to show favor for Jacob. <laughs> Well, why did he show favor to Jacob? I have no idea. Why did he show favor to you and I and show, give us his mercy? <coughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. And this is the part that we have a hard time understanding the wisdom of God and, and comprehend of it. But we're, it's supposed to make us very thankful, of course. Isaiah 55, 8, 9, classic verse. It's quoted all the time, uh, not always in context. There, the prophet says, for my of God to us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What are the thoughts and what are the ways that we cannot comprehend fully? It's the pardon and the mercy and the grace of God. Because we just wouldn't do it that way. You know, God wants us to be gracious and merciful we, to others around us. And when people are nice, it's easy. When they're not so nice, it's really hard and it's really difficult. It's a hard concept for us. In other words, there's a, an infinite God and finite man that we're never going to fully understand why he shows mercy to some and he doesn't show mercy to all, but he doesn't. And if we've come to faith in him, that's Paul's point here, it's because of his, of his mercy. And, we, and there should be a reaction uh, to that. And uh, I just it kind of <coughs> thought of this during, during the first season. Uh, uh, service and even thinking about this whole idea and, and, uh, and uh, what came to mind was the image of the guy that was uh, uh, fishing in his kayak off uh, Miley on the west side a few weeks ago and he, he caught a shark uh, and it was all over YouTube it was on the news locally but it was on the news nationally as well. I'm just curious who how many saw, the, saw the video of the guy catching the big shark off his kayak. There were a lot more people in the first service. That's because they go kayaking and go to the beach after they come to the first service. That's probably it. But, uh, or the beach course. But uh, uh, at any rate, that was, uh, it was, the deal was he's kayaking. He's got a GoPro camera, and it's just running, a little camera mounted on the front of his kayak. So it's, it's filming the whole time he's out there fishing and so forth. And what you see is about a 45-second you know, clip. Now, he's out there off of Miley, and, uh, and he sees a shark, pretty good-sized shark in the water. See, I kayak, I see a big shark, I, I go in uh, pretty rapidly, go in. But try not to make big splashes. I just go in. But he doesn't. He's still fishing for a couple more hours. Uh, he hooks something as he's reeling the fish in. This very big shark, very big, uh, Pastor Kev thinks it's a, a great white, comes in uh, and grabs the fish, pretty good sized fish that he's reeling in. 
doesn't really cut the line. He just wants his fish. He keeps fighting it. <laughs> and in the video, you see this thing jump off, off the, uh, right over his right shoulder. And then he, he sees it. And then he's coming up the side of his boat. And it's like he wants to kind of, it's like he reaches down. <laughs> the it's right there. And he reaches down like he's going to grab the line to pull the fish or something out of its mouth. And then he realizes, he realizes what he's doing. And he goes, <laughs> like that. And then uh, cuts the line, lets, it, lets the shark go, and then he kind of he pauses, and it's like it's only him in the middle of the ocean, right? So this is a totally natural reaction. He gets what we call the heebie-jeebies, and then and he kind of thinks about what happens, and he goes, three times, and he's just like, you know, there's nobody around. This is it. He's not doing it because his buddies are around. Did you see that? This is just involuntarily he goes goes through this whole thing wow. and it's uh, and it's a crack up uh, and I think when we think about the mercy of God we it's what Paul is saying just in this text is that we were all condemned and we were all going to hell for all eternity and for some reason unbeknown to us not for everybody but for us if we know the Lord he showed his mercy and he saved us and we'd be lost if he hadn't done that that's his point. And we should kind of go, <laughs> kind of get the heebie jeebies as we think about what could have been. Because none of us were, were, were deserving. I think it make, you know, I, I think it's worse if, um, uh, like for me, I had all the opportunity in the world to grow up in the church and everything, and I just kind of went and did my own thing. And by the grace of God, because I was at the bottom of the bottom, I didn't even say until I was 28. And uh, man, I just think, man, what if the Lord came back before then? You know, what if. Some of those close calls, the times I was on the ground, the, how many car accidents I would have been, all the you know things I could have been, they're just kind of like, oh man, I would have been lost for all eternity. If God in His mercy actually sustained my life long enough to to come to Him and to, and to know His grace. <clears throat> and Paul's point is that there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, and there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Is that true? Can we believe his promise? Has, it, has his plan failed in some way? No. We just misunderstand. They misunderstood his plan. He didn't save the whole nation then, but he's going to save the whole nation in the future. That's chapter 11. We'll get to that. This point here is we can believe and trust the promises of God. It's just all predicated on his mercy and not good things that we've done in the past or will do in the future. Lord is precious in the honey sweet. Some people say